Hello, everyone. Uh, the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination here at Loyola Marymount University would like to welcome you to this uh, really very interesting, exciting, and relevant event, the Los Angeles Riots, 1982-2020, at the evolution in a narrative of 42 years of social discontent. And we would like to start uh, our events in the, the ACTI calendar this new year with a topic of, of great relevance, which deals not only with the need in our institution to propel a culture of action against racism, but also to reflect upon 40 years of social discontent, which are defined in two iconic, painfully but extraordinary events known by all of us simply as the LA riots. Uh, to talk about them, we have two distinguished panelists who are both nationally recognized and relevant voices in the discussion of topics of race and race and media. Uh, during the summer, ACT, Act Team helped uh, with a, a commission uh, uh, to uh, actually promote Julia Lee and and make her engage during her sabbatical in thinking about the possibilities uh, for her new book and to find actually new topics for her, her new research. So the ACTI Commission was only called at that moment the summer of 2020 with all its connotations and implications. And hopefully that at least that is our wish at ACTI, hopefully this commission actually probably influenced uh, Professor Lee uh, with the idea of actually researching around the LA riots. Julia came back with the idea of writing her new book and she said that she will base on the LA riots and her personal experience as a woman and as a mi minority. So Julia Lee is an associate professor of English at Loyola Marymount University where she teaches African-American and transatlantic literature. She is the author of Our Gang, a racial history of the little rascals from 2015 and the American Slave Narrative and the Victorian Novel from 2010. She is a native of Los Angeles and she's now working on, on a book project about growing up Asian in black and white America to be published under the umbrella of Macmillan. Along with Julia, Acti was very lucky to find the way to bring within his complicated agenda, Eric Degans, and we are very grateful for that. Eric Degans is NPR's full-time TV critic, appearing in all network shows, including Morning Edition, Here and Now, and All Things Considered, writing for NPR.org, and appearing on podcasts such as Live Kit, Code Switch, and Pop Culture Happy Hour. He also serves as a media analyst and contributor to F MSNBC and NBC News, and He's also an adjunct instructor at Duke University's Sanford School of Public Policy. Eric has been at NPR since uh, September of 2013, coming uh, in, the, in that year from, Tampa Bay, from the Tampa Bay Times newspaper in Florida, where he served as TV media critic and in other roles for nearly 20 years. He's also the author of a book dissecting how media outlets use prejudice and stereotypes to build ratings and power. Race Bader, How the Media Wheels Dangerous Words to Divide a Nation, which was published in October uh, 2012 by Pel Palgrave Macmillan. He's based in St. Petersburg, Florida at the Pointer Institute for Media Studies. I would really like to thank you, both of you. And just to give you a little bit of the structure of today's uh, event, uh, we will ask our first professor, Julia Lee, to give us uh, her presentation, and then we'll follow with Eric Degans. And afterwards, we'll have an open conversation among the two panelists uh, regarding this important topic. So, Julia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Emilou, um, for arranging all of this and to ACTI for supporting my work. Um, and also Professor Deggins, I'm so excited that you're here to speak with us because your work has been really influential. So thank you. Um, so I wanted to take this time to talk a little bit about my research, which was um, funded by ACTI over the summer and has turned into an actual book project, um, which very recently went into contract. So I'm very excited about that. Um, 
just a little bit about myself. I do teach African American literature at Loyola Marymount. I grew up in Los Angeles, born and raised here. Um, I'm Korean American. My parents are Korean immigrants who moved here uh, first to the East Coast and then to Los Angeles in the 70s, early 70s, um, as part of this wave of immigration, um, especially from um, Korea and East Asian immigration was relaxed. Um, my parents started off owning a liquor store in Inglewood, which is very close to Loyola Marymount. And then um, after selling that, they ended up um, owning a fast food restaurant, a Pioneer Chicken, which is a now defunct fried chicken restaurant. Um, and they owned that in Hawthorne, which is just south of LMU um, near the airport. Um, so when I was starting this book project, you know, and also this summer, just thinking about the LA uprising, the LA riots, you know, I was thinking back to this kind of background, my, my parents' history, my history, um, and how it intersected directly with the, um, with the riots and with the aftermath. Um, my parents' businesses were in predominantly black neighborhoods or predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods. Um, they were those Korean immigrants who came in, purchased stores um, there, and then worked with a population who they had never interacted with before because they came from a monoracial country um, and had a language barrier, had educational barriers and things like that. So they had a very much a firsthand experience with the kind of cultural conflict that we saw play out in the LA riots. Um, that being said, I grew up in mostly white spaces. I went to a Catholic school um, in West Los Angeles where most of my classmates were Irish and Italian Catholics. Um, I then went to an, a, a high school that was predominantly white as well. And so when the riots occurred, I was 15 years old, I was in 10th grade, and I remember school was canceled and we were told to go home because it was unsafe. My high school was blocks away from Koreatown. My, my school was in a very wealthy neighborhood called Hancock Park, and it's actually where Mayor Tom Bradley lived because they had the mayoral mansion was in Hancock Park. So it was in this like very swank community, but literally blocks away from Koreatown. And you could see the fires, you could hear, you could see the, hear the sirens and the smoke. Um, and so I remember driving home and passing looters and burning buildings. Now, I don't have very clear memories of that time. What I remember is probably what all of you remember, which is what you saw on television. I mean, those are the images that are burned in my mind. Um, and it was only recently when I was interviewing my parents that I know that they came, they closed their store early. I know they came home. I know that they were terrified that their store was going to be looted. I know that there was so much pain and anguish over Sunja Du, who was a Korean immigrant shopkeeper, basically the exact same age as my parents, very similar background. My mother is almost the same age as Sunja Du. And Sunja Du was a Korean shopkeeper who accused a black teenager, Latasha Harlins, who attended Westchester High School, which again is, I mean, LMU was in Westchester. Um, and she she was falsely accused of stealing a bottle of orange juice by Sunja Du. And when Sunja Du tried to grab her, she pushed her back and then Sunja Du shot her and killed her over a $2 bottle of orange juice. And this was considered one of the triggers to the riots, along with the beating of Rodney King and the, um, the fact that his four white officers who beat him were let off. Um, those two were considered the two triggers for the riots. So here I am where I see my parents anguish because they are afraid that their business is going to burn down. And they felt that the police were not there to help them or defend them. They had the Korean radio on the entire time and the, the, people on the radio were basically begging in Korean, anybody who could to come to Koreatown and help because there's nobody there to defend them. So I'm hearing this in the background. Um, I talked to my mother recently and she said, because I had always thought, oh, our, our business ended up being lucky. It didn't end up being burnt down. And it did survive the riots, but my mother said that in the middle of the night, and again, I'm 15, I guess I had slept through it, but in the middle of the night, my parents got a phone call from the police that their building was on fire. Somebody had lit a trash can right outside their business and the fire had gotten so large that it blew out the windows. 
of their building and set off the alarm. And luckily the fire department was able to come and extinguish it before it destroyed the whole building. But my parents had never told me this story until literally a week ago, maybe, because they kept it a secret. They left, they cleaned up the mess. I mean, it was devastation, but they never told my sister and me about it because they did not want us to be weighted down with the fear of this moment. I never heard that story, but I have to say that even though I never, I did not know, in some ways I did know, I knew that things were really bad with my family. And then I remember going back to school and then being in this predominantly white environment, there were maybe two black classmates of mine who nobody talked about race. Nobody talked, it was kind of the, the elephant in the room that nobody talked about and most of the white classmates of mine lived in the west side and those were the areas that were protected from looting by the police so koreatown was completely devastated and yet the mayor's house was pristine because the police had lined up literally right in front of his house to prevent anybody from going further west and then everybody who lived in bel-air brentwood beverly hills you know playa vista i don't know if it existed then all completely untouched and so there was this huge disconnect where, you know, my white classmates are just seeing what they see on television. My black, black classmates are not talking about race at all. My fellow Asian American classmates, some of them are the kids of doctors and lawyers. They have no, they don't have any immediate um, experience with this. And then I felt touched by it through my parents. And yet I didn't, you know, they had tried to hot, shelter me from it as much as possible. But it was a moment where I really did feel like I had I was trapped between black and white. Um, this is something that they talk a lot about with the Asian American community that you know we're we're visibly raced. I'm visibly not white, and I have experienced microaggressions and sometimes macroaggressions, especially recently with the pandemic. So on the one hand, I know what it's like to be a raced person, a non-white person who is the subject of prejudice. That being said, I also absolutely enjoy white adjacency, certain privileges, access to education, you know, certain, you know, it, neighborhoods, things like that. Um, and I also recognize that there is substantial anti-Black prejudice within Asian American communities or within a Asian communities. So you're in, the, you're stuck in this in between place and then also there's a generational my parents are immigrants they come from a very different background from me and so i think trying to figure out what where you know which side are we supposed to choose i mean it really felt like korean people or asian americans it's like oh look at this in the media and this is i'm really interested to hear what professor deggins has to say about this uh, because through the media you saw this very much you know figuratively in black and white but also literally you know it's kind of like okay, the bad looters, the good, you know, peace loving citizens, but then also, oh, this is a fight between black and, and Koreans. Like that's the real fight here. And it's sort of like, you know, Korean people on the one hand were like, okay, uh, we're a minority too. And yet we're being pitted against another minority. And then any white adjacency or privilege we might enjoy is gone when it's like, oh, the police are like, see ya, like, we're, we're not going to help defend you. We're going to say, you know, help the white privileged people who want their neighborhoods safe. And so it was really like, we're screwed. We're stuck in this middle situation. Um, just, this is just an aside, but it is something that I'm also interested about with the, um, with the question of media representations, which is that, you know, the media, especially when it comes to race, their, you know, the ratings, getting eyeballs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it is about these moments of spectacle, right? Like the moment, the videotape of the beating or the murder or fires or Korean gunmen, you know, on the roof of the supermarket, you know, shooting at potential looters. I mean, those are spectacular images and they sear certain images of certain racial groups in the public consciousness and predominantly white consciousness because the truth is that for a large 
number of white people, they don't interact with black people or interact closely with Korean American people. So all they know is what they see on the television. And so, um, you know, in some ways the media becomes complicit in these images that then, you know, they only come up in moments of tragedy. They paint a kind of limited picture of these racial groups. And then they turn us into kind of stereotypes or flat figures. I mean, the reality is that, you know, black life isn't all about suffering. It's also full of joy and humanity and Korean people aren't just, you know, vigilantes with guns and, you know, they're, they're actually kind of complex too, but we don't see those images. There's so few of them available to us. Um, so basically the book that I'm trying to write is providing some of those memoiristic elements, but then really trying to think of it, um, kind of critique it, um, do a cultural critique of it and just look at the ways in which the black and white binary oversimplifies and it dehumanizes all non-white groups. And I absolutely believe that Asian Americans must be allies with their black friends, colleagues, um, fellow people of color. It is not an either or thing at all. In fact, I think that is basically the work of white supremacy. You know, it's, I mean, the work of white supremacy is having it distilled to a black Korean conflict that no, the, 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 the overriding concern is that we live in a society in which most of the resources are taken up by one particular racial group, white people, and then everybody else is relegated to the margins and then they have to duke it out with each other over their one small sliver of the pie. And I think we really have to change our perspective there. It's about wanting more of the whole pie, not just fighting for the crumbs. Um, I just wanna say one more thing before um, um, I sort of hand it off um, to Professor Deggins, which is that one of the things, I mean, I. We had recommended that, um, and I think everybody should watch the documentary by Ridley about um, the LA uprising. I think it's really well done. I I did not want to watch it because for me, it is such a, you know, kind of painful period of my life that I, there is a part of me that just thinks, God, you know, it's it's kind of like a resurrection of the trauma or feeling that pain again. But, you know, this is what happened. I mean, and this is what happens for so many groups, um, you know, especially when it comes to police brutality against black people is that the trauma just gets reawakened over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, certainly for the black community, the, the George Floyd murder and the aftermath, um, I think awakened for a lot of people, you know, similar memories of other black deaths, protests, resistance, and then for the Korean community as well in Los Angeles, I think um, I had heard stories about, you know, Korean, the kids of these Korean immigrants who now own businesses, like some guy who owned a bike shop in El Segundo and he boarded up his business um, after George Floyd's murder because he just, for him, he was like, it's PTSD, I cannot, I think back to 30 years ago and in some ways it feels like things are very different, things have been rebuilt, but things are also the same. Um, one of the things I liked about the documentary, and this is something that I wanted to bring up, was how he, um, he interviews Jung, Jung Hee Lee, who is the mother of Eddie Song Lee. Eddie Song Lee was a Korean American uh, teenager. I think he was 18 or 19 years old. And um, his parents were immigrant workers. And he, Eddie, was listening to the radio, the Korean radio, and heard these cries for help and decided he wanted to go. And he grabbed his, his gun and he went to Koreatown to try to help defend these businesses. And in the process, he was killed. It turned out by a fellow Korean, Korean American. It was a friendly fire accidental shooting death. And um, I remember his picture was everywhere. You saw this crumpled up body. It, the picture initially showed up in the Korean newspaper in black and white. And his mother um, saw that picture and thought, that's not my son. He was wearing a white t-shirt when he went out to help defend Koreatown. And she hadn't realized that he was so covered in blood that his shirt had turned what looked like black in the photograph. 
Um, and then it was later that she discovered that was her son in that photograph. So Eddie Song Lee's mother, and again, like I feel uncomfortable calling her Jung Hae Lee because I, I was raised to always be like, you're Eddie's mom, you're Mrs. Lee. So Eddie Song's mother um, is somebody who is interviewed in the documentary. And she is interviewed in her native language in Korean, which I am so grateful for because I think that the ability to express herself in her native language without the difficulty of trying to translate for an English speaking audience who may not understand her accent or whom she doesn't feel like she can get the nuance in English that she's able to get in Korean. So you listen to her story, you, she gets a platform that she did not get during the LA uprising. And what you realize is that she has so much more complexity in terms of she talks about how what Sunja Du did was wrong and she could she would never condone something like this. And of course, you know, anybody else looking at her, Eddie Song's mom would think, oh, she's a racist Korean who is probably friends with Sunja Du or they're basically the same person. And no, it's it's sort of like there is complexity and nuance there. And then she is somebody who saw her own child die as a result of this. And then she herself talks about her own experiences with you know, anti-Asian racism when she first moved to the country and moved to Virginia and couldn't find a place to live because of her race. One of the other things she does that I think is so brilliant, I mean, she's not doing it on purpose, but she's clearly learned the history of this country. So she talks specifically about the history of black people in this country. And she talks about the experience of slavery and the fact that this is a, a historical trauma and experience that the black community endured and that even the descendants who did not themselves experience slavery experience its after effects. We see it in terms of the police. We see it in terms of incarceration, healthcare rates, all of these things that you think, oh, but slavery doesn't exist anymore. But it casts a very long, shadow and it is a collective trauma and a collective historical experience that has passed down through the generations and we have inherited it even those of us like me like my parents like many people who think oh but i i wasn't a slave owner i wasn't here you know when slavery existed it's like it doesn't matter you are now american this is your history this is part of your collective collective experience or memory and you have to deal with it, you have to acknowledge it. Um, so when she was talking about this and I was thinking, God, it's so wonderful that, and I do think certainly second generation Asian Americans are learning this in school, are you know getting a more nuanced idea. Uh, they're, they're learning more nuance about American history. But when she was talking like this, I was thinking a lot about the, about the experience of trauma from the Korean American perspective. And this is something that scholars have discussed about the Korean American community, that the LA riots for them was their moment of like, welcome to America. You're American now. It's like, and you think about how tragic, you know, baptism by fire, like terrible kind of like, welcome to racist America. Welcome to your place in the hierarchy, the racial hierarchy. Welcome to the fact that, you know, you might think you can aspire to whiteness, but just kidding. Welcome to the fact that you are implicated, you are complicit in anti-Black racism. You don't get a get out of jail free card because you just happen to be born abroad and you know you don't know anything about Black history. No, none of that is true. So it becomes this moment of real psychological reckoning. And what I kept hearing from especially you know, first generation immigrants is that they kept talking about how it reminded them of the war, how it reminded them of the Korean War. And the Korean War broke out in 1950. It resulted in the, the split of, I mean, you know, it's still split nor between North and South Korea. And, you know, it was, it was not just like the gunfire, the devastation, the, the buildings burning. Um, but I think it also tapped into this historical and collective experience in the Korean community also of utter powerlessness, devastation, 
it's not just the war, which basically, you know, Korea was the, the prize that, you know, the Soviets and the Americans came in and fought over and then trashed Korea in the process. But Korea has always been an incredibly small and comparatively weak nation. So they have suffered under Japanese colonialism, which was brutal and resulted in basically cultural genocide. Koreans were not allowed to speak the language, were, had to take Japanese names, were treated as second-class citizens. Um, they were oppressed by the Japanese for forever and the Chinese and basically any other larger power around them. So what it has created in Korean, in Korean culture is this concept of Han, which I don't know if any of you have heard of. It's something that's familiar within the Korean community, but not necessarily outside of it. And I remember not even learning about Han until I was myself <laughs> much older, because it's not like my, my parents are like, oh, I'm feeling some Han right now. They never talked about it, right? But Han is this term that has no translation in English, but it kind of is encapsulated in this idea of sorrow, anger, powerlessness, resentment, despair, depression. And it's the result of an accumulated history of oppression. And in some ways it is the curse of being Korean. And it's kind of, it's actually amusing because nowadays, you know, people will talk about, I'm on Twitter and, you know, people, Korean Americans will be like, oh, I believe in vengeance. Oh, I believe in, you know, punishment. Oh, I'm enraged. I, I don't believe in like turning the other cheek at all. And, and a lot of times they say it's the Han. It's like, you know, when you've been part of a group that has been treated like, garbage for a very long time, there is this sense of like, there will never be any justice, but how do we keep going? And I know the cultural situation is different than it is for black Americans. Absolutely, it's a totally different you know, context. But what has been useful to me is to think of the LA uprising as this moment where you see basically this like kind of collective and historical trauma of the black community collide or unite with or something with this collective historical trauma of Koreans and Korean Americans. And I am still trying to figure out how, like where to go from there, but it really does seem like this is kind of a reverberating moment where this now becomes a kind of a united, I mean, again, Koreans who thought of themselves as Korean first and American second, this was the moment where they realized, you know what? We are American and we can't just detach ourselves and say, but we're not black. We're better than black. You can't do that. No, this is your history. You own it. You must move forward, accept culpability when necessary, but also work to fight, fight this oppressive structure that is against all of us. Anyway, that's where I'm sort of ending right now. Well, uh, thank you so much for that um, wonderful commentary. I mean, that was, uh, that was revealing and, uh, and just poignant. I, I really appreciate hearing it. Um, from my perspective, I had a very different um, intersection with the LA riots or the uprising or whatever people want to call it. Uh, when it originally happened, uh, I was on the other side of the country. I was in Pittsburgh um, working my first job as a reporter for the Pittsburgh Press newspaper. And the NAACP organized the march through the middle of the city. And of course, everyone, all the white power structure in Pittsburgh was freaked out because they were afraid that a, a riot was going to happen that was similar to the uprisings that had happened in Los Angeles. And so there was just a ton of police presence and there was a ton of media attention. And of course, um, the people who ran the newspaper, the white people who ran the newspaper, um, sent every black reporter who worked there to cover the march, thinking that for some reason, it would be less likely that we would get hurt. I don't know why they would think that, <laughs> uh, especially if the cops started something. But at any rate, um, you know, all of us young black people who had just been hired and were working in suburban areas and things like that were suddenly asked uh, to come downtown and cover this march, 
which went off without a hitch and everybody got freaked out over nothing. But what I, um, what I realized in that moment was that there was a ton of pushback in white society against the notion that the uprisings were an uprising, that the riots were some sort of expression of oppression. Why would they trash their homes? Why is this going on? And the other thing that, that, that struck me when I, when I heard uh, you talk and Julia is that the whole Korean element of it um, wasn't, didn't make much of an impression uh, on that side of the country. It was viewed as a, as a black and white thing. And, 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 and they, you know, you might hear a little bit about, oh yeah, uh, there were Korean uh, business owners who were worried about their businesses getting destroyed, but that was it. <laughs> and we were on to, you know, Rodney King and white officers and, you know, black people trashing their homes and white police officers. And there wasn't a lot of talk about the Korean element uh, of what happened. So that, that's, I think that's a di the difference of location, you know, and, and I have a feeling that outside of, of California, the rest of the country had a very different um, perception of what was happening. Uh, I do think across the country, um, that that debate about whether it was a valid uprising and whether it was just mostly criminals taking advantage of social unrest was what was happening and what was in the media where, where I was. Um, and and what, what's interesting about watching, um, like when, when Let It Fall came out, John, um, John Ridley's movie, uh, actually, there were there were uh, I reviewed five different documentaries um, that came out around the 25th anniversary of the Los Angeles riots, and and Let It Fall was one of them. And what I realized in looking at all of them is, um, you know, it's the benefit of hindsight and it's the benefit of distance. And so what these documentaries did, and I thought Let It Fall was kind of the best example of that, which is why I uh, suggested that we watch it. Um, is, is uh, seeing the full context of what happened. So Let It Fall, you know, talks about um, the controversy over chokeholds and how many black people were getting killed by the police because they were being, being put in these chokeholds. And, and, and Daryl Gates, the, the police uh, chief who infamously militarized um, the Los Angeles Police Department and seemed to use it as shock troops to keep um, people of color in line in their various um, you know, deprived neighborhoods um, um, was, was, you know, created controversy by uh, saying that black people physically for some reason were most susceptible to dying in chokeholds because it obviously couldn't be the fact that white police officers were using chokeholds on black people more than they were using them on white people. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that it detailed, you know, this, this uh, incredibly sad case uh, of a, a, a young man, a young black man who was subdued with a chokehold and the, the Ridley interviews the police officer who was a part of the arrest and the officer is talking about how this young man was under the influence of PCP during their uh, confrontation, during their struggle. And at the very end, they just put up a little title card saying there was never any evidence found that this person was under the influence of PCP. The officer had just assumed it. And so what we're, what we're getting from these documentaries is the long tail. You know, all of the um, instances of police brutality and, 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 and police overreach and police assumptions that led to the frustrations that erupted um, in, in the riots in that moment. And so we get a, we get a better sense of, of what led up to it. And, uh, you know, uh, o the, um, the ESPN documentary, um, uh, Made in America, o. J., the O.J. Simpson story, that's, that's an even better documentation because it goes all the way back to the 50s and talks about how black people moved to LA thinking that it was some sort of paradise and that they could get away uh, from the racism of the South only to find a new and much more dangerous level of racism amongst the police officers when they got to Los Angeles. And so, you know, you talk about that concept of Han, I think, uh, I think black folks have a version of that too. You know, you talk about how we're different. We are different, but we're the same too. We're, we're similar too. Racial oppression uh, has elements of it, uh, you know, sort of oppression, um, unfair oppression, whether it's visited on women or, or people of color or uh, people over their sexual orientation, there's always elements of it that are common across those groups. And then the very specific circumstances that are different. And I always felt 
like Koreans and black people, particularly when we're talking about the LA riots and those, 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 those times, were kind of trapped in systems where uh, we were unfortunately pitted against each other, right? Um, Koreans are trying to operate their businesses and, and live their lives and, and maintain their communities, sometimes in situations where they don't even understand the black people, the mostly black clientele that are patronizing their businesses very well. And, and black people are in these communities that are deprived and they're going to these businesses and they're saying, you know, why are these people taking money that I don't, I don't understand these people, I don't understand their culture, they're taking money out of our community and, they, and they're treating us with suspicion. And so you get, you know, neither side understands each other, both sides have resentment. And then something like, um, you know, the acquittal of the four officers who beat Rodney King happens and, 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 and that emotion explodes throughout the community and, um, and, it, and, it, and it just obliterates everything in its path. Um, I, had, I had friends, um, I'm a musician, and I had friends who moved to LA around 1990. And so when, when the riots happened, they actually sent me pictures. Uh, they drove around their neighborhoods to, to sort of show me how, you know, uh, the, in, the, in, in the areas where people of color lived, devastation, and then a few blocks over where white folks lived, like Christine, like they, should, they, even, they sent this stuff, but I, was, I, I couldn't believe it, you know, but these, do, when, I, when, I, when I watched these documentaries, I got a sense of the strategies of the police officers and, 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 and why it played out that way. They made sure that the devastation was limited uh, to the areas where, where poorer people with less power uh, mostly lived. And, um, and, and it's all, it's all, it's all uh, a result of these systems kind of rubbing up against each other and people being caught inside of social dynamics that they really can't control once it gets to that point. Once it gets to the point where people in the streets and they're rioting, you know, um, we, we've sort of lost control of everything. And, and what um, strikes me too about the media-ness of it all is that when stuff, something like this happens, um, and, and we're in the middle of this uh, explosion of emotional energy. That's when the media wants to try and talk about race, which is like the most combustible subject in American history. It's tough for us to talk about race when everybody's calm. How do you talk about race when somebody's business is burning down and you know someone's uh, friends have been brutalized by the police and uh, a, a historic injustice that was captured on videotape and, 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 and beamed all over the world uh, goes unpunished. Uh, you, you can't sit down and have an open and honest and, and, uh, and searching conversation about race in a situation like that because everybody's polarized in their positions and they're angry and they're, uh, they're hell bent on winning the argument rather than communicating with people that they may not fully understand. And so um, I think those are some of the failings of media that uh, outside of California, the nuances of the racial elements of the riots weren't really explained very well. And um, the, the conversation about race and racial difference, they tried to have it too soon uh, at a point when, when people didn't even really understand what had fully happened. And the, the benefit you have with distance at least is that you can try to engage those conversations in a more measured way and with a little bit of understanding of what happened because we've had time uh, to, to look at it. And if you watch each of those five documentaries that I watched, and I, I did a piece that's on NPR.org that people can can look at if they, if they wanna see which five, um, you, you get a look at each facet of um, the uprising through different lenses and you get a much better sense of what happened, why it happened, and how to process all of that and, and work towards um, breaking down systemic racism and breaking down these systems so people aren't pitted against each other in quite the same way um, again. So that's, that's, sort of, uh, that's sort of my uh, take on, on uh, what happened. That's great. Thank you so much. I have so many questions. Sure. <laughs> So, you know, I, did you uh, hear about the LA Times recently uh, came out? Apologize with for racism. Yeah. <laughs> and 
I, yeah, I mean, I, I was reading, I mean, the LA Times has such a problematic history, right? And, um, and they still are dealing with uh, a staff, you know, a group of reporters, editors, and all the management that are still very much not reflective of the diversity of Los Angeles. Yeah, I, I have several friends at the LA Times who are fighting that fight, so yeah. Very oh my, God. yeah, and you know, and, and they did interview this, I mean, I thought it was really powerful, but they interviewed a black reporter who had been tapped to report on the riots because they were sort of like, oh, we don't have any black reporters. Hey, you from, you know, working on the Sherman Oaks desk, why don't you come over and, 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 and go you remember the camp? name of the reporter? Was it Greg Braxton? I, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, Greg. Yeah, and he, and he talks about how he was like excited because, you know, instead of being on the sleepy Metro desk or whatever, he can actually be, you know, in the middle of the action, but this was a chance for him to finally get some, you know, write some articles, get some, get some publicity. And then as soon as the riots were over, he was tapped on the shoulder by his white editor and was like, okay, you can go now. Yep. We're done. We're done. Yep. And he was so crushed right devastated just kind of like oh you know so i'm like a token convenient when necessary but then thrown back into the trash and he actually confronted that editor like recently i think sent yeah, much later yeah yeah, yeah. I, read that. I was like you I, I don't know i would have kept that to the grave and just been like i, I hold grudges for, i'm korean I would hold grudges for <laughs> <laughs> see i would i would have confronted him when it happened that's that's, oh, that's, see, that's, that's, that's <laughs> That's my problem. I wouldn't have waited 30 years. But uh, but that is, you know, that is not an unheard dynamic in 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 media. Um, some of the earliest um, black reporters who worked for mainstream media outlets like the um, New York Times uh, wound up getting those jobs because they were tapped to cover racial unrest. And, um, you know, the, again, the people who are running the newsrooms looked around and said, if we send a, right, a white reporter to Watts, you know, he, he might come back in a body bag. Can we find a black person to do that? And so, um, so a lot of um, uh, black people who might have been working in marketing or might have been even pushing a broom, but had, you know, aspirations to be journalists or might have been copy boys or whatever, you know, got opportunities to become reporters uh, to help cover racial unrest. And indeed, you know, the genesis of the National Association of Black Journalists came about because those early journalists realized they needed a group to advocate so that when um, the, the emergencies passed, um, you know, uh, black journalists could, could, could be recognized for the work that they did and, and actually become journalists and not be, um, you know, forced to go back to uh, wherever they had been, uh, you know, summoned from. Uh, and be allowed to pursue journalism careers if that's what they wanted. And um, so that's, you know, I mean, that's that's the other thing that, that struck me about in watching all these documentaries about the riots is that this is a pattern. All of this is a pattern. You know, uh, a, a racial um, injustice happens and then the emotion of the community spills over into rioting and damage. And the police make sure that that damage is confined to the places where people of color and poor people live. And the media tells the story in a way that is often one-sided and often favors uh, the powerful. And then a few, a few years later, it happens again. And, and so um, part of understanding that it's a cycle um, means trying to understand how can we redirect that energy so that um, when that response comes to the injustice, that it is, that, that more is achieved and that less destruction is created. And I don't think we've even gotten close to that yet. Um, but we got to recognize now, you know, after Michael Brown, after Freddie Gray, after uh, George Floyd, you know, the cycles are getting tighter and tighter. And, uh, and there's got to be a way to, to, um, to find progress on racial issues that doesn't involve poor people uh, burning their homes down. I mean, the, you're at NPR and you have been at NPR for seven years, I guess it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you feel like your organization, and maybe you are not, you don't feel comfortable saying in this venue, but I guess this is the, I was just reading an article today in the New York Times about publishing, you know, mm-hmm. which produces, you know, lots of print media and publishing is a very, very white industry. And so they were tracking it. And it's like, you know, every time there's some sort of racial uprising and people suddenly think, oh, I need to learn about this. You see a spike in the sales of books by black authors. But as soon as this moment passes, then it's like, okay, now we're back to just, you know, 98% white authors on the bestseller list. And so how much of this do you think is just another passing fad, you know, part of the pattern of like peak of interest you know, in the way that the media covers it or in the way that publishing decides, oh, we're going to push out these books and sell them. And then it just dips. And then- right. Well, you were, you were going to ask me about NPR. And I yeah. will say that I, I do think that there are a lot of people at NPR who, do, who are trying to get right on this issue. And we're in the middle right now, I think, of a process where, um, you know, management is trying to diversify and there are very committed people uh, amongst the staff who insist that they make progress. And, um, you know, uh, I, I was telling somebody the other day, you know, um, I, I come from newspapers and I'm older. So uh, when I came to NPR, uh, the newsroom was 22% non-white. Now it's up to 30%. That is by far the, more, the most diverse newsroom I've ever worked in in my life. Uh, most of the time I've been in newsrooms where the percentage of non-white people, all, all non-white people, um, was like 13%, 15%, something like that, right? So, you know, NPR is twice the diversity of any other place that I've worked. But the younger people who come in are like, you know, down white people are 40% of the population. We're not going to rest until national public radio reflects the diversity of the public. And I'm like, hey, I'm with you, you know? And so um, we're pushing for that. And we have employees who will not rest until it gets to that point and, and will have no hesitation to call out management if they call short and have been calling them out. You may have, um, have seen that our, our union put out a very strongly worded statement about what NPR needs to do in order to get right. Uh, but we should note that NPR has much more diversity in its newsroom than most newspapers. And uh, w- what strikes me about this is that it's, you know, Treating this as an episodic thing is part of what perpetuates the pattern, right? If you don't constantly talk about racial issues and explore them every day in your coverage, then you are helping create a a situation where people feel like they have to burn their neighborhoods down to get national attention. And then the pattern reasserts itself again. So part of breaking down that pattern is making sure that we have regular coverage of racial issues all the time. I mean, if you turn on a local TV newscast, um, they will have a report on the stock market. It may only last about 30 or 40 seconds, but every day they're telling their viewers how the stock market is, is doing. Basically, they're telling their viewers how the 1% money is doing, right? As, as some sort of indication of the economic health of the nation, uh, which it isn't. But uh, we need to find a way to constantly check in on the racial and social health of the nation every yeah. day. How do, we, how do we reference this every day? And when will you do it? Uh, you know, some of these networks have created units that are devoted to uh, reporting on race. And, and I hope that what they're gonna do is create regular reporting that talks about racial issues. And I hope they won't spend a year on some mega project that comes out once and then they spend another year working on another mega project. And those are wonderful things and they're often very needed, but then that perpetuates the pattern, which is, you know, we find some huge scandal and we kind of lay it on people and it's all rooted in race and everybody gets upset. And then you try to talk about race and it's even harder. And then we don't talk about it that much again until the next emergency comes around, until the next expose comes around. And, and what I found sometimes is that my audience is trained so that when I mention race sometimes in stories, they perceive it as if I'm making the story all about race or if I'm trying to talk about some scandal or some calamity connected to race, even when I'm doing a story where it, the, you know, race is a tertiary subject 
And I'm not even trying to present it in a scandalous kind of way. It's like the audience has been trained that that's how we talk about race when, when something awful's happened and now it's time to get alarmed. And we got to break that down if we're going to break the pattern. Absolutely. Because I, you know, what, what I often think about is how racism, it, I mean, you know, people like to think, oh, that was a racist inc in incident if somebody shows up in a KKK hood and like burns a cross on somebody's lawn. But right. racism is also just the incredibly mundane daily experiences and the accumulation of that. And it might not make for as, you know, spectacular story, but it's more indicative of the kind of daily pressures or the daily stressors. Yep. What is the demographic breakdown of the NPR the actual listening public? Mm -hmm. uh, what depends? Like our audience uh, on the radio is uh, wider and older than our audience uh, on podcasts. And, and, and then we also have a huge digital audience uh, that's um, reading the website and, and reading uh, sort of print stuff that's attached to the website. So we, so we have a few different audiences. We have the audience that comes to our website uh, we have the audience that comes to our podcasts, and then we have the audience that comes to our radio and audio products, especially our broadcast, uh, our flagship broadcast shows. So, all so each of those audiences is a little different. And as you get more, as you get closer to to, to digital technology, they get younger, uh, and they get more diverse. Yeah. No, I have to say, I mean, I'm I love Code Switch. I think that is such a great. Oh my gosh, great podcast. Um, the other thing that I've noticed, because, you know, NPR is famous for that NPR voice. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say that they're, they are now kind of breaking out of this standard English, you on know. The, like, on purpose. That, that has been a, a... Love it. I'd say about, I'd say when I started working at NPR, that's when we started having discussions about what the NPR voice is and how that marginalizes some people of color. Absolutely. Um, I do. I do think that we still um, have a ways to go with accents. You know, some someone who has a heavy, um, you know, accent connected to speaking Spanish or speaking French. Um, you know, I think they might still have a hard time getting uh, regularly featured at NPR. But um, you know, we do have a lot of people. I wouldn't say a lot. We do have some people at NPR who have you know, um, pretty prominent jobs on the radio pretty regularly who don't fit that stereotype of the radio voice. Right. And, uh, and I think that's important. You know, we, what was interesting was, you know, like as far as names go and, 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 and um, where people are from, you know, we had already kind of conquered that. We had a lot of people whose names, you know, revealed the diversity of the nation, you know, and, and people would even, you know, you, you fans would talk about it online. You know, they love names like Mandelito Parco or uh, Lulu Garcia Navarro or. <laughs> <Nari you know>. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> they love they love all that. They, you know, they love that. They love the diversity. They love the fact that they are encountering names in NPR that don't sound like the names that they encounter on CBS or NBC um, or, or other mainstream news outlets. And we just had to make the sound of NPR sort of uh, reflect uh, what we already had in our names. And, and I think, you know, we're getting there. We're always talking about it. We're trying to do better. Um, and uh, and it's it's a struggle to break down some people's attitude about that. Um, but but uh, but we're we're trying. I think that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. I, you know, it, 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 you know, I mean, what's interesting, too, you know, you talk about systems and you talk about how how legacies work. And I think that that's so important in understanding why this stuff happens the way it does and why people seem to be so clueless sometimes about why things are happening or why there's tension or, uh, you know, why an uprising breaks out and then why it gets covered uh, the way it, it, it gets covered. And, and, and part of my struggle as someone who's tried to be an advocate for diversity in newsrooms and trying to talk about racial issues is I'm constantly going to the people who cover news and, you know, the people who control newsrooms and saying, you know, you got to understand what's going on here. You know, you, one, one of the things I talked about, uh, again, in another presentation was that when I started out 
you know, I, I start my first professional job was in 1990. Um, a couple years before that, I was a cost reporter for the student newspaper at, at Indiana University. And part of my job was to go down to the police headquarters and look at the arrest log and copy down the information. And then we would run these little blurbs in the newspaper saying who got arrested and what they got arrested for, right? So basically what we were doing was we were taking the police's word for why somebody was arrested, what circumstances led to them being arrested, and even the information about the person who was arrested, their age, their ethnicity, um, their appearance, right? We were, we were taking the cop's word for all of that. <laughs> and and, and, and the, the School of Journalism at Indiana University was training journalists to do that. And now we realize, you know, uh, after many years and after much protesting about police brutality, that that's terrible journalism. And that um, the, the, the police blotter should be a starting point. It should never be, um, the, the, it should never be considered verified fact just because the cops hand it to us. But it's taken a long time for journalists to get to the point where they're willing to say, okay, uh, just because a, uh, a police document says something, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. And that doesn't, and it certainly doesn't mean that we should tra train our audience to accept what the cops say is true by taking stuff from a police blotter and throwing it in the newspaper and serving it up to them and saying that's journalism. So, um, so it, it's always about getting people to understand the system behind the information that they're saying and, 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 and getting even the people who are part of that system to question every facet of it. Why are you doing the things the way you're doing it and how can you make it better? That is so, and I, it's still, I mean, it's still being unlearned Today, I mean, LMU has a very young journalism program, and there have been cases where an older, you know, not not somebody on full time staff, but an older journalist will bring in the police chief or somebody and say, "Hey, this was a great source of mine, et cetera, et cetera." And it's almost like institutionalized, like this is your buddy; you get to be good friends with him. He will give you stories. And it took a younger journalism colleague of mine to sort of pause and tell the students that's, you know, he can be a resource, I guess, but he's not God. Yeah. What's well, a fine line? You know, it's, it's one of those things where if you cover a beat for a while and you get to know the people on that beat, you do get to, you, to become friendly with them, but you also have to have this sense of it's, it's like, it's like, um, it's like, uh, it's, it's like LeBron James being friends with uh, Steph Curry. You know, when they're out in public or whatever, they can be friendly, right? Or if they see each other at an NBA event, they can be friendly. But when it's time to compete, all that goes out the window. And it's about, you know, uh, doing everything you can to, to, to do your job, you know? And, and, and so, but I think that's hard for a lot of people. That's a balance that's hard for a lot of people to maintain. And that, you know, we just had a controversy with Susan Page from the USA Today, who was hosting parties for legislators at our home um, that she was paying for. Uh, and, and these are chummy parties where everybody's getting together and being all friendly and drinking and trading gossip about the Beltway. And, and can you, after you leave that party, write a story that burns that person that you were having a drink with and joking with? If you can, okay, but most people can't. And it looks terrible, you know, it looks, it looks terrible. So, um, you know, that's why, you know, you know, journalists are discouraged from doing stuff like that. But, but I will say that it, it's tough because um, if, you're, if you're human and, you're um, somebody who is collegial, then it, when you're dealing with somebody on your beat over a number of years, you know, you're bound to be friendly with them. You're bound to find out who their wife is and kids are and all, you know, you, all that stuff. You just have to be able to be a killer when you have to be, and they have to understand that that's your job. And we can be all, you know, friendly and talking about our kids. But if I find out um, that something awful is going on in your office. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reveal that story, even if it gets you fired. Wow, that's great. 
Well, this has been a fantastic conversation, really uh, so inspiring. Um, I, I, before, before I let you go, could you please indulge me uh, with one question? And I, I, I'm, I'm really very grateful to you, Eric, because uh, uh, there's this semantic in terms of uh, how do we brand this historic event? And immediately is the, the word that comes to mind is LA riots. And you were very specific about uh, saying uprising, which has a, a completely different connotation in terms of social activism and the meaning of the unrest. And, uh, and obviously the, the way that it is branded uh, actually reflects uh, a point of view from the media on how to title the story, right? So when, when, when 2020 comes and we have the George Floyd uh, protests, immediately is branded again as the LA riots to make like this almost seamless historical connection with a, an act of uh, sabotage that the community has to experience. So, uh, uh, so, so it, it, my question, and, and, and there, there's this term that you, uh, that you said about uh, the most combustible subject, which is uh, talking about race. Uh, I am wondering if, uh, in, in, in your opinion and, and yours, Julia, uh, is, the 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 events in the in themselves the 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 social unrest the uprising of eighty two actually consumes itself or does it triggers at it becomes a catalyst for community organizing our communities are is the black community more organized socially and politically speaking after the riots or not does it, it, it does it become a, a social uh, catalyst for political activism? Is there, is, is there a logical response in terms of that? And is the, the Korean community more politically active after the, uh, after the riots or the uprising of 82? Is there, is there, a, is there a, a consequence in those terms? Julia, you, you, I feel like I've been talking a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but, no, it's super interesting. I mean, what I, I think that for the Korean community, it was the moment where it was like, you can't just stay on the margins or stay on the sidelines and just be like, I'm not involved. I'm not, you know, it's not my fight, whatever. Yeah. It, it was really a kind of moment as well where the Korean community was like, wow, we have to get invested. We have to get involved. We have to do that work. Um, you know, I think there's some thoughts that maybe some immigrants felt like they were just going to, you know, come here for a few years, make a lot of money and leave. And that was a moment where it was like, no, we're here to stay. You know, our children are born here. We are here. And so we must invest in things like political activism, representation. I mean, you are seeing, and this is something that I'm deeply conflicted about because, you know, you do realize, oh, well, in some ways you need political representation in order to have your voice heard among the people making laws, et cetera. And what you're seeing, and I find this fascinating, is that I think there were three Korean American women who were um, recently elected to office and two of them are Republican and one is um, a Democrat. The Korean American woman who's a Democrat is half black, half Korean American, and she is a second generation. I mean, I think she was born here, um, but the two Korean American women who are Republicans are first generation immigrants. They were born in Korea. And I think they have a very different idea of like race and age, you know, what it means to be Asian American in this country and um, sort of the values that they espouse than this woman from, I think it was Seattle maybe. And so I think within the Korean community, I mean, it's not like one political block. There's a lot of, I mean, just like with any group, you know, not all black people vote the same, not all, you know, not it's, it, there's lots of subtleties there, but in the Korean community, I really think it does break along generational lines, particularly. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, I live in Florida, I live in St. Petersburg, Florida. And, you know, so sort of the Cuban experience is a really interesting one. You know, um, the Cubans who are here in Florida and who uh, dominate politics in South Florida, particularly, um, were the Cubans who left um, Cuba when Fidel Castro took over. And so they were the elites. They were the people who, uh, who owned and ran uh, all the businesses and property 
that uh, Castro nationalized and, and they were white. Um, and the servant class was, was my color, you know, darker. And so they come to America and they don't see themselves like as an oppressed minority. They see themselves as the rightful, um, you know, they, they want to be shot callers. They want to control everything. They did it in their home country. They feel like they should be able to do it here. And I think there's a weird dissonance sometimes when they come here and they realize that, uh, you know, some Americans look down on them because of their accent or because of where they came from. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I sense, you know, that that happens sometimes with a lot of immigrants where if they were part of the ruling class where they came from, they come to America and then they suddenly realize they're not perceived that way by Americans and it can be very jarring. Um, you know, black folks, we have always had the status that we've had since we've been brought to America uh, unwillingly. And so I think, you know, it's a very stark, it's a starker choice for us, right? Um, there is one party that believes that systemic racism is an issue in America and needs to be dealt with. And there is one party that believes that racism in America is a result of individual actions and that it systemically does not affect policing or education or employment or housing. So if you're a black person, which party are you going to vote for? <laughs> you know, it's pretty. It's pretty stark, and 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 that's the core uh, argument that we don't talk about when we want to talk about race. When we when all this stuff happens, you know, does systemic racism exist, and does it impact people of color so severely that the government needs to deal with it? That's the core of questions about immigration questions about affirmative action programs, questions about police brutality, questions about diversity and education. It's at the core of all of that stuff, but we never talk about that. <laughs> we're, we're always talking about the symptoms and we never talk about you know, the core um, dysfunction. Um, so I think that's part of the problem. But I also see that every time this pattern repeats itself, the people who are involved in the pattern react differently because they have learned particularly in recent years. Activists know that the response to an injustice will be judged by the destruction of that response. So there was a concerted effort in the wake of George Floyd's death to try and keep the protests nonviolent and to try and, and, and keep them from damaging where the protests took place. And, and, you, and you found that you know, we had this pattern where the damaging, you know, the, the rioting didn't really break out until nightfall came and it was hard to see who was starting stuff. And of course there were allegations that there were provocateurs who were coming in and you know breaking windows and things like that to try and start trouble even though they weren't part of the people who uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters or the anti-racism protesters. And of course you know you could also assume that some criminals would use the cover of darkness as a way to um, you know uh, loot a store because they wanted the stuff that was in the store. You know, and, and that's always been a problem is that when, when this emotional intensity breaks out and you have a riot slash uprising, some people are uprising and some people are rioting. <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, I don't completely blame the media for using that term because both things are happening at the same time. And it's hard to figure out who's doing what or why it's happening. Because like I said, once that tiger's out of the cage, it's just, it, it's bedlam. And, and, and it's hard to tell why something is happening. And even the people who are doing it, I mean, I fully understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, but I think um, people, especially now, are very aware of um, this pattern and how to try and manage it so that they can get what they want out of it. Uh, so the, the police know that they have to limit instances where they are seeing um, you know, beating up on people with no reason. Mm -hmm. um, the activists know that they have to try and keep the protests nonviolent so that they don't get accused of uh, encouraging lawlessness. Um, the, the people who don't believe in systemic uh, racism realize that their goal is to scare the general population into thinking that the people who are protesting police brutality don't want any police to exist 
and, and, and get them afraid of what's going to happen if the police are unfairly held back. Everybody's understanding how to spin the situation and it all gets engaged uh, when, the, when the protests start. And we saw that happen this year uh, in the wake of all these George Floyd protests. And we saw Black Lives Matter, like, like the approval of Black Lives Matter go up. And then when we got closer to a presidential election, it went down. Once, once, once conservatives figured out how to scare white people about Black Lives Matter, um, they were able to pull down that approval rating and, uh, and, 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 and rob the group of its support. And that's another reason why this pattern reestablishes itself. You know, you have um, an incident happen and people, people's eyes get uh, uncovered and then there's a backlash. Yeah. There's a, there's a backlash, and some people get convinced by that black by that backlash, and 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 the backlash might be, um, you know, uh, unfair criticism of Black Lives Matter, or it might be the candidacy of Donald Trump, but uh, but the backlash comes, and it always convinces some people to change their minds back. Thank you, um, Julia. Any uh, last words? No, I think this was a great great discussion. I learned a lot and I'm really, yeah, I thought it was awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you, uh, Eric. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Emily Lou. Uh, so um, just for our viewers, uh, the the uh, the web page is going to contain some external resources as, uh, for example, Eric just mentioned some NPR.org uh, link that it's useful information along with other things that are going to be living in our website. So thank you again, everyone, so much for this engaging uh, conversation. I hope to uh, have you again soon at some event in ACTI. Thank you again. Pleasure. Bye, everybody. Bye.